I love broken games. I don't mean like Cyberpunk 1.0 broken where you're falling under the map and NPCs are T-posing at 10 frames a second. No, I love games that let me, if I can manage to, get wildly overpowered and either completely blow past any barrier the game throws at me, or just go down swinging in a flurry of wild moves and crazy visuals. While there is a measure of restraint necessary to make these moments work, I personally believe that balance is the enemy of fun. Or at least, my idea of balance is significantly tilted towards buffing abilities, classes, cards, or units, rather than nerfing them. It's just more fun that way. And I'm gonna make that point by telling you about some of my favorite card games. Bolitro is a game made by solo developer Local Funk. It was recently signed by Playstack Games. You might remember that NBZ, for my video Why Great Games Fail, works at Playstack Games. He's the one that turned me on to Bolatro by sharing a link to the Steam demo and a Discord that we're a part of. And folks, I can't put this game down, literally. I've been playing it on Steam Deck basically everywhere I go. Bolitro is a poker roguelike deck builder. Each round, you play four hands, getting chips in return, trying to clear the blind before you're out of hands. Also, you can discard up to five cards up to three times, optimizing the cards available to you to make the best hand. In many card games, jokers are wild. They slot into a spot, making it easier to complete a straight or maybe a flush that you were trying to complete. But in Bolitro, jokers do a lot more. You start each run with five joker slots, and after every round, you'll get a shop. Here, you can buy jokers with all sorts of abilities. Even Steven gives you plus 40 or score multiplier for every even included in your hand. The regular old joker just gives you a plus four molt on every hand. Supernova gives you one molt for every time that you've played a certain hand so far in this run. You get the idea. While there are ways to edit the standard deck of 52 cards during your run, the primary way that you construct a build in Bolitro is via these jokers. I love building for playing full houses. This is how I've completed the demo with pretty respectable numbers, but I've seen other players play a single pair and get millions of chips in return. There's a lot that Bolitro is doing to give you that traditional one more run feel that any great roguelike can provide. But the most effective parts to me are the ways it enables broken builds that would feel impossible in your first round playing. The final blind of the demo is 50,000 chips, but in the Discord for Bolitro, I've seen a single hand produce trillions. And that was only a pair. That's not to say that 50,000 chips is easy to achieve. In fact, I've only done it a couple of times, but there are combos in Bolitro that can outdo that by many orders of 10. And importantly, the ability to achieve these astronomical numbers does not mean that the game loses its fun. In fact, the ability to pull these numbers off, or even numbers slightly less large, make the game worth playing for me. And you know what? That's a familiar feeling. Spoilers for Inscription incoming. Inscription is a roguelike deck builder in all the ways that matter, but is also a deep narrative-driven experience that only makes sense if you escape the boundaries of the typical roguelike gameplay loop. The base card game here is incredible. It's a riff on Yu-Gi-Oh mechanics kind of that both simplifies and adds to that game. And it's wrapped in a creepy set dressing that amplifies the horror aesthetic the rest of the game has going on. Just like Bolitro, Inscription wants you to break its game. If you don't, you're never gonna get past its opening act. And while I agree with many that act one is the best part of the game, there's a full experience here that you shouldn't miss. Inscription helps you break its card game in a few ways. The first that you'll encounter is likely the Sacrificial Stone. Here, you can sacrifice one of your cards and give its sigil abilities to another card. This lets you create some pretty wild combos that can help you progress much further towards your eventual goal of beating your captor at his sick games. The first time you lose, though, you'll encounter the second way that Inscription helps you out. When you lose a round of the game, this person that's trapped you in their cabin and forced you to play their game will take a photo of you and give you a chance to create a death card. These are cards that allow you to choose from a small set of stat lines and abilities, and they can be really overpowered. You can get some wild combos of low cost, high health, high attack, and abilities that the built-in cards in the game only have on less powerful cards. It's a fundamentally unbalanced idea, but that imbalance is what makes death cards and inscription in turn fun to play. There's actually an iteration on this idea in Act 3 that I'm not going to show you here, but that mechanic lets you build your own card outright, using any of the game's mechanics that you've encountered so far with almost no limitation. It's very clear that you are meant to use this ability in order to see the game through. Not doing so can be a personal limitation, sure, 
but the game is designed for you to find this freedom. Inscription has many, many other ways that its mechanics aid its narrative goals, but the one that I think of most when I remember that game is totems. These are passive abilities you can enable within a run by combining a totem head with an animal on it and a base with an ability on it. You can make all your wolves have the Tuth of Detch sigil and kill any card they damage. You might give all your insect cards Mighty Leap, letting them block all airborne attacks. But my favorite way to break the game is unkillable squirrels. Now, to get this, you need to know that in order to play most cards in Inscription, you need to sacrifice some number of other cards according to the cost of the card that you want to play. But the game gives you a few free cards, the most basic of which is the squirrel card. In any given turn, you can choose to draw a card from your deck or draw another squirrel to use as a sacrifice. If you've played Magic the Gathering or any other similar card battler, this is the way that Inscription does mana. I won't tell you how because I think there are some really unique mechanical aspects of Inscription that you should experience yourself, but eventually you'll find a squirrel totem head, allowing you to put any sort of wildly overpowered sigil onto all of those free squirrel cards that you can play. This includes the unkillable sigil, which returns any card adorned with it to the owner's hand when it dies. That's infinite mana, and in any card game that I've ever played, that's usually unbeatable. In Inscription, you can definitely still screw things up, but what this does is give you a nearly guaranteed path to victory in Act 1, letting you see what the rest of the game has to offer, but it wouldn't be as effective without something called juice. In Balatro, whenever you play a single hand that scores you more points than the blind you're trying to clear, your score starts to catch on fire. Go even further over your target and the fire grows. Blow that target out of the stratosphere and the score numbers shake and the fire breaks through other elements on the screen, letting you know just how sick your current combo is. Balatro is incredible at using visuals and sound to make every hand feel good. As each card is scored, it shakes. Its chip or molt bonuses pop up above the card and a satisfying sound happens to let you know that those bonuses were added to your score. And the same goes for jokers. It's informational so that you know exactly how you achieved your score, but it also feels great. I play with the speed turned up, and at the end of each hand, it's super satisfying as a result. Also, I just love the sounds of poker chips clinking against each other when you get paid at the end of a round. No matter how your run goes, it feels incredible to either completely whip ass or to lose to some flashy visuals and auditory celebration. And then there's the little things. Joker cards come in special variants like foil, holographic, and negative, which make the whole experience of creating a build within a run more fun. Certain tarot cards let you mechanically but also visually change cards. Molt cards have this kind of hectic pattern that I now associate with good. Stone cards have no suit or value and their sound effects are unique. Glass cards have this unique looking shader on them and make a really tactile glass shattering sound when they break. Every element of this game evokes a feeling through its visual and sound. Inscription goes for something different with its horror vibes, but it's also nailing the juice it's going for. Flying cards flap their sides like wings. Certain sigils glow to signify effects or importance. When enemies activate their totems, the soundtrack changes, a wind picks up, and the whole scene turns red. Big spoilers here for the end of Act 1, but at the end of a run, your captor is against a giant purple moon, which casts this pinkish purple light across the board. Debris swirls around the scene, and in the final stage of that battle, that debris is reflected as orbiting the moon in your opponent's oversized moon cards artwork. Another game that nails this juice is Marvel Snap. When you play Cyclops, he shoots a laser beam in your opponent's direction. Hulk, She-Hulk, and Abomination all hit the game board as if their cards were super heavy and had fallen from very high up. Many of these cards have voice lines. Thor calls Mjolnir when he's played, and the Mjolnir card flies onto screen in a crack of lightning. A few of my favorite pieces of VFX are primarily informative. Jessica Jones VFX will highlight which location that you shouldn't play on if you want her bonus. This game has cards and locations with depth effects, animations within card art, and even cards that have surprise animations like Brood's glowing eyes in the Dan Hip art variant. And that's not to mention just how great the in-game music is. Every moment of playing Marvel Snap is made more fun simply because of how intentional Second Dinner is about how it's presented. But to get back to the core of the video, Marvel Snap has a balance problem. Most often when we talk about balance in games, we're talking about multiplayer games, because that's where an unbalanced game would be the least fun for all involved. Or so it goes. I'm not here to fundamentally disagree with that idea, but especially in multiplayer games, I think the way games are balanced often sucks all the fun out. 
Marvel Snap has a pretty active schedule of over-the-air updates that tweak card stat lines and abilities. They've talked pretty openly about having internal views of data, showing which cards are dominating the meta and in which decks. And I know they spend a lot of time being really careful when making decisions on how to and whether or not to buff or nerf certain cards. But too often, in my opinion, decisions are made to limit a deck archetype. And I'm not concerned about a specific deck or a specific card that I like being nerfed. It's more that the overall strategy is to rein in quote unquote overpowered cards or decks even, rather than to make every card or deck feel overpowered. Sure. Eliath, which destroys all cards your opponent played on the last turn, feels bad to play against. But I'm not sure that reducing its stat line from 6 energy 5 power to 6 energy 4 power does much to solve that. It's more fun for everyone to find another card or deck archetype in the game that could be buffed to address that problem, or simply to introduce a new deck archetype entirely through new content. I watched a video recently from Strictly Better MTG where he tried out the Pokemon trading card game as a person who plays so much Magic the Gathering that that's his entire YouTube channel. His point was that the Pokemon TCG lets you do wild stuff all the time, because there are just so many cards that shake up the game state. Whereas in Magic, cards sometimes have paragraphs of text that only serve to limit the effect of certain abilities. Magic is a game that is balanced by collective limitation, whereas according to Strictly Better MTG, Pokemon is a game balanced by collective empowerment. It's no secret to me that the games that I herald as examples of perfectly unbalanced fun are single player, and the ones that I'm touting as overbalanced are multiplayer. The issue there is fundamentally one about money. People don't spend more money on a multiplayer game that doesn't feel quote unquote fair. You don't build a competitive scene on a game that isn't at least somewhat focused on balance. But that's why in large part, I don't play competitive games. I'm always looking for a game's version of Persona 5's Baton Pass, the thing that lets me absolutely break things every once in a while and feel just for a second like a god. So go check out Balatro on Steam. <laughs> no one's paying me to say that, it's just a good game. And I think that more people should play it and more people should make games that feel like Balatro and Inscription made me feel. See you all next time.